Um, I have a mix of materials, so um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, you see there, title of my talk and an image of uh, Arthur Rothbard. He was an artist, for sure. Do uh, you remember those, those um, cartoons? But he was a, an industrial engineer. He had a lot of ideas in his drawings about the future. How is the future going to look like? And um, so one of the things that is interesting to me is how he thought about scale. He thought about doing many operations with the same pad, with the same machinery, same piece. And he, he also thought about alternative forms of energy. He was talking about hydrogen cells and things like that. So pretty much ahead of his time, very futuristic, but, but it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to see how people thought of them. <laughs> The challenges that they have. Uh, that's the introduction. I want to think about three, three keywords for my talk. One would be energy use. Of course, the setting is agriculture. Energy use, information, and technology. Okay. So let's let's see how we can get those themes into a very different farming systems. So let me start with some. Forgive me if I'm too didactic at the beginning, but I think it's necessary that we set some stage to the, 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 trying to understand where we are at the moment in, 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 in our use of information and energy. So in this picture, I'm showing something that hasn't changed and will never change as long as, I mean, in our, it's, it's constant. It's our ability, the human ability to produce work at a maximum rate of what um, 75 joules per second. And that is basically impossible to sustain in a, in a full day, right? We can do that for a moment, you know, 48 hours, or 10 or 12, whatever. Um, but our brains have a capacity to process information. That's also not gonna change in our time frame. And that is uh, 60 bit per second. That's okay. how much, how much there is really, but it, it doesn't matter if it's actually 100 or, 50. It is very much limited when we look at a computer. But before going to the computer, on the, on the right, you see a tractor of the 1980s, um, purely mechanical. There was nothing electronic in those, in those tractors. And that's the result of years and years of tractor technology and mechanization. It was really, really good machines, very strong. It really was transforming or taking energy embedded in a fuel, chemical energy, and make that into useful work. Tremendous benefit to society just by, by doing that. And it could do it at a much, much, much larger, uh, faster rate than a human, of course. This is an estimate. It'll take it more than that. Uh, very, very small in comparison to human beings. So that takes us to the, the picture in the center. In the 1980s, now we started seeing personal computers, okay? And what that has created is in this phrase from this paper um, of Bill Chancellor in 1981, and that is individuals now have a much, much larger information handling capacity. Okay, so we are harnessing um, energy at a higher rate just because we have not the means to use some computers. Okay. So keep that in, in, the, in the back of your mind. So why, why is this relevant? As we're moving forward, I think we're getting away from systems that produce so much good, but are bringing now new challenges to society. Um, are with me on that. Now, uh, the good story and or things that are, are really, really positive, and I truly believe it, very, very, very positive. These are things that happen in the in California, University of California, Davis was instrumental in developing these machines. This is a very old model. The newer machines look impressive. So, but it was a, um, an evolution from hand picking in the 1960s to some form of uh, mechanical aid and now to machines that do this. So labor hours per ton of production just dropped. There's countless examples of this. And production went up. 
I mean, from two million tons per year to, to 10. So five, five fold increase. That's, that's great. University of California was sued in the 1970s because there was this concern that there was these machines were going to displace people and fairly labor. And University of California won that, that legal battle to prove that those people were going to be moving to higher levels of um, management. Okay? And that story has been proved to be the case. So we shouldn't be concerned about new technology. We should embrace it when we find that there is such a return for this. Good story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend some time on this, on this uh, <clears throat> slide for some important reasons, I believe. So uh, this is all centered on this, this plot from a book published in, in 2010 by Backlab Smil. It's a Czech scientist, lives in Canada. And he's, a, he's one of those people that knows about everything, you know, physics and biology, everything combined. So first, take a look at the, at the, at the I will describe this graph in more detail, but first let's look at the vertical axis here, the human development index. That is a metric developed by the United Nations to measure how things are developing in, different, in all countries that are maintaining this. And you see, it's all kinds of social uh, aspects to it, not just economic aspects, but it is a computation normalized from zero to one. Okay. Uh, I don't know the details of this computation. Okay. I don't know what brings those numbers up and down. All, all I know is from zero to one. That's here. But what uh, Backlab did is compare that to the energy supply per capita and found this very interesting relationship. Let's talk about this. At the very bottom of this, very low human development, there are systems like these that are happening today. Mm -hmm. Today, this place people from wars. This even has its military gear and stuff like that. Very, very sad situation, very low energy use. And we go to see these types of things in Europe or Canada, and it's just so lovely, so pretty that even tourists go to, to see these, these type of settings. Such a contrast. Well, it happens that that contrast is very, very, very well explained by adding energy consumption. Okay, so the two parts for this that are very important to me. One is that the slope of this portion of the function, very, very high slope. So we can gain with little amounts of energy, we can gain a lot. And I hope as a human that we have interest in moving moving the needle for those, those countries that are so far behind. But let's look at this section where it's basically flat. Okay. So what it's telling you is that no matter how much more energy you use, you will not improve your human developing index. Yeah, a moment. So is that a point where we are simply wasting energy and not living better? Yes. Look at the difference between Japan and the US. This is 2010 roughly half of the energy per capita. And still they have a very nice edge human development index. So with that, what I'm saying is that, no wait, this is not my area of expertise, right? So I'm just looking at materials that are out there and say, so maybe urban farming has a very strong point to, to be taken into consideration as we look at our standard of living, as we look at our concerns for the environment as we look at our energy use. Okay. Hey Pedro, yes. when you when you use the term energy as it applies to that curve, could you could you like give us an example of what you mean by that? Hydrocarbons. It's okay. petroleum based. Okay, energy. that's that's the energy you need. That's the only okay. Energy. All right. So let's get into more ag related topics, and and I, I chose this slide to start looking into now information. And I see a lot of people smiling. Uh, I learned how to drive tractors here and <laughs> many years ago. And that was a time when there were good tractor drivers and bad tractor drivers, right? There's, you really had to be really good to keep that steering wheel in straight, that, that side on the very, very long. <laughs> that was fun. It was a very fun time. 
And on the, on the right, you have a newer tractor. What's interesting is that identical rated power capacity, the, both tractor units, tractor, um, they can deliver the same amount of work, physical work, okay? But now we can have all these uh, different aspects that make more productive this technology, okay? This technology, this particular tractor can be now driven autonomously. It's not in the US, not yet fully embraced, but it's moving very fast that I can tell you. We don't have in Arizona, but in some parts of the United States, you start seeing that more and more. So be prepared, you start see, you're gonna start seeing that. By the way, and around this is some, something that I think will resonate with you. We used to fix those tractors. Yeah, <laughs> that's the bad thing. This is impossible. You can just stare at it and yeah. all you can do is call your, your sales reps and get another bill. Well, I suppose for the dealer to fix it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but the point is to the topic, this is what's different. This is what is now coming in, in technology and that's what we're gonna be applying. We're gonna move a little faster and, and I'll get into the topic of precision planting. That's something that I've been doing for some time and I'll, I'll continue. There's, there's so many open research questions. But as we look at history, this is, these are all pictures from Arizona. Well, not all, this is not. But you see how we were transitioned from animal sources of power, very little amount of work productivity that was available. But once we mechanized that with, with the tractor, um, now we have four rows in the 1960s, at this uh, gasoline engine here, things were good. And if you look from 1960 to 2000, 40 years, we had this huge jump in machinery size. Big, big, big tractors. There is the lots of power. You see a, a, a dually here and, okay. But if that happened in, in 40 years, wouldn't it be that in 20 years now we'll have even larger tractors, like twice as large as this big monster tractor? Well, the thing is the trend is different now. Now we're looking more information into those power units. Okay, so that is a good thing. That that brings uh, lots of benefits. So from a, a, a tractor driver whose job is just to keep it straight, now you have a tractor driver who is looking at all kinds of different. Uh, parameters to optimize that operation is engaged with. We have gener we are generating information as we go, soil conditions as they are encountered by the planter. We are adjusting on the go depth and closing forces, close trench closing force, depending on the soil strength and, and all kinds of things happening automatically. Big flow of information to the controller and to, to, the, to the record keeping aspect of, of the operation. So good thing, I believe it's a good thing. In, in 2023, what we are doing now, we're exploring the use of this um, conservation tillage um, units uh, that are in the front of, place on the front of the, of the planter. What we're doing is we are trying to get rid of the dry soil on top, do a very good mixing, and put the seal where there is a seed, where there is more moisture and soft soil on top. And that's here, represented here. And this is the, the uh, sensors that we are deploying it along with this. You see the, the seed in the trench, impressed and before closing. And here is what we want, is to put the seed surrounded by moist soil and this year I'm more smart than the previous year. One time I put this uh, animation like this with a ruler and Karen said, wait a minute, that's too deep. <laughs> and we had like a 10 minutes back and forth. No, it isn't, yes it is. Uh, so I, there's no rule in this time. I see that. But it is a deep planting anyways. It's more than one inch, Karen. Okay, so the theory that we're exploring is, can we put the seed, the seed where there's moisture and above soil that is loose enough so you won't take that much energy for the seed to emerge okay can can where's Kyle can you run this video there the one on the right pop up 
of some. Oh, that's okay. Never mind. Maybe it didn't transfer. That's okay, Cal. It was just a, big, uh, uh, a video showing you this tractor doing all these operations real time. Okay. Uh, we'll leave it for some other opportunity. Now, okay, let's start to now get a little more and more into what will be a setting that is more urban than high production ag. So uh, for that transition, I chose this work of an uh, ag economist from the Midwest. And this is a conceptual uh, graph. There are no numbers in the horizontal scale. But what this is telling you is that with all these costs, there is an optimum where costs are minimized. Before that point, with little or no machinery available, your costs are really, really high. You can only imagine what you can do if you don't have tractors or a capacity in tractors. And of course, as you go in excess, you're not really gaining much. There is an optimum. And over here, you see, um, there's this, this um, tools to select the right, the right proper size tractor and size of equipment. This is all based on modeling for ag engineers and all these const, uh, const, constants that are having developed fine. So it's, it's good. But now as a transition to a small scale setting, like in an urban setting, this is what I did. I put 2.5 miles an hour uh, for a one row planter. Something okay. If I'm thinking about a small, very, very small scale urban setting, what will be the result? Well, the model crashes basically. Mm -hmm. Whatever numbers are there are meaningless. In other words, these models only work for that high power setting that we're used to. Okay. Meaning that we need, we, there's a lot of work to do for us if we want to get into this area. There's a need. So, all right, um, I'm gonna speed up a little. Here's my last points here. And one is about something that we know fairly well, the relationship between horsepower available, rated power, and the cost of the, those power units. Okay, they increase uh, to some point that they've, they're flattened. I found only those, those five numbers to, to put in to make my point, but this will be higher if it's gonna be a newer, in order in 2004 model. But this is it. You have these machines available. You pay their cost is not very, very high compared to other parts of the world. And you get the support of a dealership system. Dealership system. Whatever is that good, but, but you have that support. Okay, now, if you look at what's available for a small holding, that's an acre, two. Well, you, you have a lot of options, but very difficult to, they have many, many things against them. For instance, this tractor was developed or uh, intended to be for the market of Cuba in the US, I think for Cuba in the previous administration or two administrations ago, and started with a tech price of $10,000. Yesterday was 23,000. So at that point, well, there is not much difference from a, uh, a John Deere, a small John Deere tractor. Okay, so it started to be a little more uh, the cost element, the service um, repairs and those kinds of aspects start to be a little fussy. Now very clear. Now going to brand equipment with a strong deal dealership support system, we have the case of Kubota, which they are ahead of any other brand simply because they're a Japanese brand. Okay, and they've done this work for a long time. So they have actually that is that is very small land holding. And that's one of the reasons why the energy consumption is low. That graph the best. But you have aspects like this, they call this a compact tractor. So engine, diesel engines from 25 to 40, horsepower, 20 to 27, rated PTO power. So you can do some work with this. Very limited, but you can do some work. There's strip on hitch, there is hydraulic power, there is electric power available, and it's all over protection, about $19,000. So 
that is an option. And of course, you need the implements that are right. Uh, let me show you another example. Now they call this a utility vehicle. These are pictures from our program, uh, the U of A. We have these one row planners. That's probably what I chose that one row planner in that spreadsheet. And um, so anyway, you have, you have a hydraulic power, you have trip on hitch, you can move up and down, very limited amount of power. But this is a utility vehicle. You can do more things than not just driving a, a planter. You can, do, you can move equipment, you can move hay, you can move whatever it is. So it's very useful, very versatile um, units. 16,000, there are implements available for these machines. Um, okay, so now, we have a problem with scale, okay? These small farming one acre fields, five acre fields will have always that against them that is a small scale, okay? So machinery is, is a difficult factor. How about these ideas that have been floating around about sharing, um, online sharing, like the Uber or Uber system for, for farm equipment? Well, there's one example. I want to bring this one that was uh, it, it's only only lasted one year and next year in 2016 it went out of business okay so very difficult that's telling you it's a very difficult market yeah. this is happening in africa so here's my point why if urban settings are better suited for this type of machinery sharing schemes I don't know the answer. I'll be very interested to know how things develop in Africa. And maybe that will be a solution that will fit our settings. See. Okay, so now my last very topic is about when I thought about urban farming, I also thought about, well, what about these um, greenhouse systems and these other things that are also taking part in, in the urban settings. So I want to say for greenhouse and vertical farming, these kinds of things are happening. There's a lot of research done here. Very, very energy intense. Okay. So if you want to have an example of something that takes tons and tons and tons of energy to be produced, that's right. You have to control lighting, you have to control temperature, cooling, and very energy intense. They're there. So uh, as People have come with ideas on how to improve that situation. Uh, let's see, in hydroponics, now they're combining hydroponics with um, solar panels here. So they're producing some energy. Um, I'll, be, I'll be very interested to see what's the net benefit out of this. I don't know if they're doing that research. And that's, this is at the U of A. Now here's something very interesting to me too, that's agreeable types. Also the U of A happening, a pioneer on this, and they're growing crops and they are producing. It's, it's like an interest producing energy. Is that rhubarb? I don't know for sure. I don't know. So the deal there is the research is installing solar panels and then growing a harvestable crop under the panel. That is that is the case. So it's like the crop and the and the solar panels, the photovoltaic, are competing for the same source of energy. The yeah. sun. Right. So, what is that orientation? What is that that mechanical and electrical design that will provide energy for both in a symbiosis between the the shading of that structure in the crop? So, very interesting. I don't know. I, we'll see. There's hey, a lot. Pedro, of, have you seen that um, where the tomatoes are? Is that on top of the administration building at the U of A? The no. admin. No, this is this is that's the, out of the farm. This is out of the farm. Okay. Um, Campbell Avenue Farm. Yes. Okay. So anyway, I want to finish with, with this. Uh, this topic is further developed. Okay. My thinking goes well. There's very little that I can do, and I'll be happy to get my input on what is about machinery and machine systems in general. But uh, these are people. U of A people that are key in their areas that, are, that will be very, very happy to come to these settings and share information with you. Okay, so first is Murat Bashira. He is the director of the CEC, C-E-A-C, Control Environment Center. Um, 
Joel Swallow is it's um it's an expert and has developed a lot of work on vertical farming and algae growing also to generate from to generate energy. And this is Greg Baron Ford. Um, so look at these solar panels and crops growing here. So there's there's I think they're playing with very different designs, and that will be very interesting to me to see how it works because I can see the need for equipment, machinery, down here, down here, maybe in the middle too. So I'll stop there. Um, I did what I could with the topic. Sorry, 